Welcome. It is so wonderful to look out to this audience and see the dear friends of our father and your friend, Jerry Yellen. I look out into the audience and I'm very comforted to be in the company of the wise, those who truly understand the range of life from A to Z and from A to Ka. And certainly my father lived his life from Ka to A. And he went out with tremendous fulfillment and fullness and contentment and peace in his heart. So now I'd like to introduce my brother Michael, who will talk about his experience with our father. Um, I, I want to thank you all for coming to the memorial service. The outpouring of love and condolences has deeply touched me, my brothers, and our families. Uh, Jerry and Helene had four sons. They were loving parents who provided everything a child could ask for. We, his sons, had pretty have lived pretty interesting lives, in large part because they lived pretty interesting lives, and because they provided the support, encouragement, compassion, understanding, and love at every step of the way. Our oldest brother, David, is um, not here due to illness. I know you were deeply moved by this memorial service. Um, uh, Jerry and Helene moved to Fairfield, Iowa from Del Mar, California. Uh, if you haven't been to Del Mar, it's a special place, sitting on the coast north of San Diego on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. My parents used to walk from their house to the beach and watch the sunset. I would visit for breaks while in medical school, and I would cry having to get on the plane to go back to Brooklyn. There had to be something beyond the ordinary and far beyond the natural beauty of Del Mar to entice them to leave the home and place they loved. And looking out at the people in the theater here, I see and, and know what drew them to Fairfield and why they settled here for so many years. They found a community that fit them like a glove. I'm deeply grateful to all the friends in, in Fairfield who shared their lives, their stories, and their adventures. I have to particularly thank Jim and Ginger Bellalove for opening their arms and their hearts to Jillian and, Her and Jerry and Helene and to the Yellen family. Uh, we're here to honor and to remember Jerry, but to do so, you have to understand that without Helene, I don't think Jerry would have been half the man he was. or would have accomplished half of what it accomplished during his lifetime. <laughs> Indulge me, thank you. Um, she was an angel, 100% behind Jerry from one job to the next, from New Jersey to Israel, to Florida, to California, to Iowa, back to Florida, and back to Iowa. She supported him when he was down and glowed with him when he was up. As you know, Jerry suffered from PTSD. He was not always easy to live with. He sometimes had an intensity about him that was fearsome. He sometimes was impulsive. For 65 years, Helene was a steadfast and faithful rock solid supporter. And in Helene's last few years of life, her health and strength faltering, Jerry stood by with his unwavering support and love to the very end. I 
I have to do this again in Montclair next week. I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, there were a couple for the ages. What a remarkable life Jerry lived. He never talked about his war experience when we were growing up. I knew he flew fighter planes in World War II, and he had some war memorabilia in the closet. That was all about, that was about it. I did not know that he suffered or, um, from, from what used to be called shell shock or battle fatigue, but is, but is now known as PTSD. He kept it to himself. I'm grateful that my mom was watching Merv Griffin when Maharishi was on the show talking about TM. And I'm grateful that my dad had the wisdom, openness, and strength of mind to try something new at my mom's suggestion in 1975, because what he tried changed his life. But even after TM quelled some of the demons in his mind, he still did not talk about the war, not until 1986, when he had a catharsis of sort. We went to see the movie Platoon. At the end of the movie, movie there was a scene of bulldozers pushing mounds of bodies into an open pit. My dad broke down crying, reliving the same real-life scene he witnessed on Iwo Jima. From then on, he did not stop talking about the war or writing about the war. But his newfound openness to talk about the war was inseparably influenced by Rob's move to Japan and the birth of his three Japanese grandchildren. His message of love, of peace, of preventing wars was his message. Jer Jerry never spoke of the supernatural. He believed in nature, and his message was tied to the rather simple but sometimes opaque reality that we as human beings are all the same and are all connected by nature. His story and message resonated with so many. Jerry had the energy and spree to match anyone. He was the life of the party and lit up any gathering. His stories are legend to the very end. He had a full calendar through 2018. On the day he died, he was supposed to be taking his first flight in a fighter jet, an F-16. He was scheduled to get an award from the Iwo Jima Association of America in February and from the Wings Club in March. He was supposed to go back to Iwo Jima, and I was going to accompany him on my third trip to the island, but it was not to be. In the end, Jerry approached death the same way he approached life, head on and without fear. He said death was, a part, was part of the cycle of life. It was very hard for him the last few days of his life, unable to eat or drink, too weak to move. Two days before he died, he asked me how much longer. I told him, Dad, a few more days. He said, OK, I'll sweat it out. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm going to miss my dad a lot. I already do. I miss my mom terribly. I wish I could take comfort with the thought that he was with my mom or that I would see them both again one day, but that's not what I believe. My heart and minds are filled, my heart and mind are filled with sorrow, but I have many, many cherished memories of my dad that I will carry with me the rest of my life. And may we all share and continue his legacy of forgiveness, of peace, and of healing between people and nations. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Now I'd like to ask Jim and Ginger Belilov to come up and say a few words. He was an extraordinary man. He kind of lived an extraordinary life. He was a friend. We hung out with him. He was good fun. He, he always had a joke. He always had a curiosity. He liked everyone and everything. Um, but he was more, in a way, more than that. He was a symbol. He was a sort of a living uh, history of his generation. He represented what his generation was all about in the history of the country. And he kind of knew that. He knew that. And it was his job to, to speak and to tell that story. And um, so that was really the motivation to have a, a film that would endure and that, that story could continue to be told. Um, he grew happier as he grew older, which is a, a wonderful, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, particularly as he came to believe he had this important mission 
He had a, a charisma, he had a way of connecting. We went to so many presentations he made, he never failed to connect, he never failed to get them, people to laugh, he never failed to get them to cry. And whether they were young, uh, young or old or service or Japanese, American, whatever, um, he had that connection. He actually really, I think most of you know, really loved everybody, everybody he met. He was probably the most gregarious man I knew. He could make a, make a friend in five minutes, a, life, excuse me, a lifetime friend in five minutes. It was a wonderful thing. So uh, Ginger and I traveled with him quite a bit. We saw him in Japan and Hawaii and around the States. And a few little incidents I think are indicative and Ginger was there, so she'll tell you. And there was always something when we traveled with Jerry, but let's see. Once when we were at the um, Indy 500 where he had been invited, he was the featured ve uh, veteran of, um, to pass the torch. Uh, from his generation to the next generation of military leaders. And this is in front of a crowd of 300,000 people. And his picture was up there on the screen. It was incredible. Broadcast to all these people, whether they were in the stadium or in the remote stadium. And um, it, it was quite a moving moment for him. It was a moving experience for us to be with him. He loved it. Uh, but the race, it was hot. He got poured. We want to go back, be where it was quieter and cooler. And as we walked through the crowd, just back to the shuttle, it was really amazing. The crowd parted the way. It seemed like everyone wanted to shake his hand. They wanted to uh, tell their story or a story of a family member. They saluted him. And it was just a way that Jerry was that invited people to do this and share their lives with him because he shared his life with them. <clears throat> there was also another event at World War II, the World War II Museum. Jerry stopped the procession to shake the hand of every one of a long line of soldiers and sailors and give them words of encouragement and upliftment. So it's like everywhere we went, everywhere he went, he was like a talking, walking, talking, walking photo op in his uniform, his manner, his openness. Uh, it gave everyone a feeling that they could approach him. They all wanted to have his picture taken, their picture taken with Jerry Yellen. So we don't know how many hundreds of pictures are out there of um, people with Jerry. So this was the life of Jerry. This is the kind of life we shared with him. He truly loved everyone. He told his story, and he inspired, he consoled, he uplifted people. He was just a man, he said, uh, but he was also larger than one life. And he was basically a universal symbol of the best in man. And. He was very inspiring to us, and I believe to others. We'll always remember him. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim and Ginger. Jim and Ginger are hosting the Yellen family that is here, myself, my brother, and my niece, Sarah, is also here from Japan. So now let's hear from my brother, Robert, who couldn't be with us but made a video. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending my father's memorial. Uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you. Um, and I just want to send a little message from Kyoto. I'm standing in this amazing temple uh, from a man named after a man from the 1100s named Honin. And I once saw a picture of him, or a portrait, and his face radiated love and compassion. And I kind of feel that Jerry did the same through his trials and overcoming them. And I'm forever grateful. Uh... Oh, wow. Um... 
to have been on this journey with him from New Jersey to Iowa to Japan. And um, for your friendship, oof, and compassion, and being there for my parents, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. This pond is where half of Helene's ashes are. Um, Jerry, can you pass me those photos? It's so odd because I found this beautiful young couple to record this, and it turns out that the man's name is Jerry. <laughs> so here's a photo of Helene and Jerry. I don't know, taken in the 80s. This is me and Helene and Jerry with a statue of Kanonsan, the goddess of compassion and love. And so Jerry will be reunited with Helene in this eternal pond of souls and joy. If you ever come to Kyoto, I'd be happy and honored to take you here. Um, it's a very majestical, peaceful, tranquil spot. And I hope one day that you can visit. But again, to everyone in Fairfield, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being friends Oof, to my parents. And God bless all, if there is such a thing. And namaste. Arigato. So now we'd like to, I'd like to ask um, our esteemed mayor, Ed Malloy, to come up and say a few words about Jerry's life. Ed and Jerry were very dear friends right from the first week that my parents moved here. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to start by thanking Stephen and Michael and Robert and David for sharing Jerry and Aline with our community. <clears throat> It's a tough day for me too, Michael. <laughs> the grief has been coming out. This is a day that I thought would never come because my friend Captain Jerry Yellen made me believe he would go on forever. He believed that and desired that <clears throat> because he grew to fully appreciate that he was in a unique position to be a special messenger of peace among nations and cultures. He was on his final mission and he treated every day like it was his last. And right up until his final hours when he would give us one more reminder of what he learned in his life. Jerry's early training and military experience made him a mission man. He embraced and embodied the mission with a rare passion and sense of absolute duty. It made him the best kind of soldier, and in his latter years, the best messenger of peace. I met Jerry when he first arrived in the late 1980s. We met long before I became involved in politics when Jerry and Helene decided that living close to their son Stephen and among <clears throat> a group committed peacekeepers was their next adventure. Jerry and Helene fit in and became everybody's favorite greatest generation couple. Jerry and Helene became an integral part of everything I have done politically, and they were a strong, loving presence in my family. My wife, Vicki, my children, Justin and Kelly, all adored him. Jerry liked to tell the story of when we first met. Jerry and I were in the waiting room for some special spa treatments with nothing other on other than a sheet wrapped around us. Jerry was not shy to introduce himself and laugh at the irony of our meeting. We wasted no time swapping stories and getting to know each other and realizing our life passions and goals aligned. Every time I met with Jerry since that day and until last November when he walked out of my office for the last time, it was a joy. We shared our inspirations, insecurities, challenges, and accomplishments. 
Jerry was living in Southern California before coming to Fairfield and shared a story with me that while driving to work one day, he passed the exit, a route that he had traveled for a decade. For Jerry, this was a sign. When he got to work eventually that day, he told his partner that he wanted to sell his share of the company. His intuition was so strong that it was time to make a change while being drawn to the unknown life in Iowa. He knew that was the moment, and he went home and told Helene, we're moving to Iowa. <laughs> the best fighter pilots have that intuition to guide their quick decisions. I can only surmise that Jerry's extraordinary intuition led him here to begin the second half of his life where he could reflect on his destiny and become the brilliant author, speaker, and messenger of peace to the world. He had a community to support who he was and help shape his life story into a mission. Jerry would take it from there and use his incredible networking skills to build a platform for his message through his writings and engagement with everyone in this community with a passion for peace. Jerry had a remarkable natural ability to meet someone and find a connection that would be valuable to both parties. Most of the people in this room today met Jerry that way and know exactly what I'm talking about. I loved that about Jerry and watched it happen many, many times. Part of this skill came from the years he spent as a Dale Carnegie leadership instructor, where speaking someone's name and making them feel special and connected was a hallmark. Jerry had a natural feeling of respect and friendship for everyone. Jerry had no hesitation in the pursuit of his goals. We learned this early on in his life story when against all odds he became a fighter pilot and boldly approached the squadron commander to state his intentions. Jerry had no hesitation to introduce himself on an airplane to Brian Frankish, who produced Field of Dreams, about making a movie of his life based on, of, on his first book of War and Weddings. He had no hesitation to reach out to Luke Jensen when a story of his struggles with PTSD after serving in Iraq and Afghanistan appeared in the Des Moines Register and Jerry invited him to Fairfield to learn TM and alleviate his suffering. Countless times throughout his life, Jerry would engage people of influence who could help him reach people in the military, in government, in elementary schools, veterans organizations, wherever he could bring his message of peace. What we all also learned from Jerry through his writings and talks was his deep care and commitment for those he served with. In the most recent brilliant book about Jerry's war experiences by Don Brown, the last fighter pilot, we are brought vividly into those 19 missions over Japan that Jerry flew with his utmost concern being the protection of his fellow pilots and wingmen, and ultimately the sorrow of losing many of those he served with. Jerry carried those men and his whole life with, for his whole life, especially Phil Schomburg, who was Jerry's wingman on that final flight as the war was ending. My father was on a destroyer escort for the U.S. Navy in the Pacific as Jerry flew his final mission. When I think about them together in that point in time, I see where the convergence of the influence of these two great men came together and had an impact on my life. As Jerry's status grew in his final years and he became one of the few remaining veterans of the war that 16 million Americans fought in, the power of his personal story raised the status of his mission. And I know he left us fulfilled that his work would carry on. I did not know war and combat in my life, but I did know what it was like to be a wingman because that is where Jerry let me be in his final mission to spread the message of peace and the care and healing of veterans. This great captain and friend will always be in my heart and his memory will forever be connected to Fairfield. 
the base of his final mission. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Now I'd like to invite uh, Barry and Kate Ross, um, two of Jerry's really dear friends, to come up and speak a few words about my father. Well, I wasn't expecting to come up here. I thought it was just Barry. So I'll just be very brief to say how cherished both Helene and Jerry were to both of us. And we shared a lot. Maybe we were a little closer in age than other Fairfielders. Um, but we were always deeply comfortable together and loved their joy of life, their almost childlike pleasure at new things, um, beautiful things, fun things. And so we did do a lot of fun things together and shared that joy. Helene was a beautiful woman an elegant lady and a deep, held a deep place in Jerry's heart. And I think for that, we celebrated them both as one. So when she passed, some piece of him went with, some piece of her went with him, and I, I feel that it's a wonderful chance now for them to be together. And they had four beautiful kids and wonderful grandkids, and. He leaves his legacy. We've seen it all here already. So I feel blessed we had that chance to get to know them and have time with them. But I think they live on in all of our lives. Thank you, Kate. So my first image of Jerry was outside the women's dome. I had come up to pick up Kate, and he was marching up the hill from the men's dome. And I was so impressed with his elegance, his white flowing hair, uh, his demeanor, uh, his greeting to the people around him, and how well liked he was. I didn't know him. I was just observing him, and I said, "Well, who's that?" You know. And someone said, "Oh, that's Jerry Yellen. You know, and he's a great golfer." And uh, and he flew B-51s in World War II. And that really attracted me, the whole thing. <laughs> in that, I've been a pilot most of my adult life and been a golfer since I'm 10 or 11 years old. And he was a person that, that uh, epitomized the adventure of being a World War II pilot and, and the accomplishment of having played competitive golf, as well as being kind of an attractive and interesting person. And we started to engage together in terms of those activities. And uh, I learned a lot from Jerry on many levels. Uh, and I, we played golf a lot, and, and he, would, he actually straightened my slice out, uh, <laughs> which I'd never managed to do. And it was just fun to play with him, and he, he wasn't overbearing in any way. It was just fun to be out there together. And we'd get tips, and, and uh, I would get tips. And he was also very careful not to be overbearing, not to Im uh, impose himself, which is a wonderful trait and the easiest way to learn from someone. And I learned a lot just from watching him swing. If you saw that swing just now, it wasn't the big swing that he had when he was younger but he had such a smooth tempo. Just the way it went back, the way it went forth. And about uh, two months ago, we played a few rounds together here. And it was amazing how far, at his age, he could hit the ball. Uh, and it's great, a great short game and that kind of thing. So it was something we shared and, and uh, I immortalized in some ways in, in the years that I illustrated for Golf Magazine. I probably used Jerry as a model at least 10 times. And so I have all these pictures of Jerry swinging this club or that club or so on. Um, and where it came to flying, uh, I owned a plane here, I sold it about 10 years ago, a aerobatic uh, two-seat airplane um, with, uh, it always felt a bit like a fighter plane, but not quite. 
And Jerry and I would fly in that plane every so often. And there was, uh, the impressive thing was that, you know, he'd, he'd be sitting behind me and he could not see the instruments at all. I mean, um, so he didn't have any idea what the airspeed was or whether he was flying in a coordinated manner. But just like his golf swing, uh, his flying was so smooth and effortless. And I recall I'd give him the controls and we'd be flying around and he said, well, do you mind if I do some aerobatics? And I said, no, no, do whatever you like. And he would go into this, you know, like you saw in the P-51, how it would go over on the back, on his back and dive down like that. So he would do a maneuver like that. Um, and there's a little ball in, a, in an arc that tells you if the plane is flying in a coordinated way. And if it's not done well, the, that little ball will slip this way or slide that way and so on. It was like the ball was broken or, or had been glued into place. And it literally did not move. And mind you, this is Jerry's flying by the seat of his pants. Um, and he was, he was really so good at it. Um, and another time we, we were doing a, a, what was called a spot landing contest where you had to land the plane on a chalk mark on the runway. And on the first time I, I, I didn't quite make it right. And then Jerry kind of leaned forward and he said, cut the, cut the throttle now, 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 cut the throttle. And we landed right on the, on the line. And we split the hundred dollars that I made. <laughs> So that was a lot of fun to share. And the other thing I did get to experience with Jerry, uh, which I'm very thankful for, is that uh, three years in a row, I guess three years, uh, I was his escort to go to Oshkosh, where he would speak and be present for the, um, or the, the largest meeting of pilots and warplane owners in the world. Uh, I was kind of his, his uh, what would you call it, his valet. <laughs> But it was a great experience, and he was so, it was like being, uh, watching Jerry at his best, walking around all the P-51s, talking to people, and uh, being treated with such respect, which he deserved, and um, acknowledgement. And at the, on the last one, I got to ride behind him in the Jeep as everyone, as he saluted everybody, and I just sat there kind of like, feeling like his little son. Um, uh, it was great, and he, he just, he presented himself so well and was so well loved, and uh, I will miss him. Yeah. Thank you. My father was deeply concerned about vets who came home from Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD, and so many of them were committed suicide every day, and he, he took that very personally. So now we have a short eight-minute clip that the DLF Foundation has put together because they have started a Jerry Yellen Resilient Warrior Scholarship Fund to teach vets TM. So let's roll that film. Captain Jerry Yellen, a World War II P-51 fighter pilot and Iwo Jima veteran. He landed on Iwo Jima on March 7th of 1945, strafed Japanese positions for the Marines, and flew 19 VLR missions over Japan. He is a member of the Military Writers Society of America. He's the author of three award-winning books, and author of this new book released today, The Resilient Warrior. He and his wife of 62 years, Helene, have four sons and six grandchildren, three of whom live in America and three of whom live in Japan. Jerry is crisscrossing the country on behalf of Operation Warrior Wellness to raise the funds to bring relief from PTSD to every veteran, every soldier, and every cadet who wants to learn to meditate. Jerry Yellen, a decorated P-51 captain and pilot in World War II. He flew 19 missions over Japan and serves as co-chair of Operation Warrior Wellness.
Thank you very much. My name is Jerry Yellen, and I'm just one of 16 million people who served our country in World War II. I was 17 on the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, and two months later, on February 15, 1942, I enlisted in the Army Air Corps to become an aviation cadet to fly fighter planes against the Japanese, whom I hated for what they did on December 7th. At the age of 19, I graduated flying school from Luke Field, and I was sent to Hawaii. And on March 7th, 1945, I flew as a professional pilot, cocky and courageous, to Iwo Jima, where I landed with my P-51 three weeks after the invasion to strafe for the Marines as they took the rest of that island. The sights, the sounds, the smells, I still see as I, say, as I stand here today. From December 7, 1941, until December of 1945, I had a pure purpose for being alive, to fight a war, to fight a known enemy, I watched as bombers dropped their bombs, B-29s dropped their bombs on square miles of Tokyo, which was burning. And not once did I ever think there were people on the ground. They were Japs. They were not human. They were my enemy. Iwo Jima was 650 miles from Japan. The B-29s needed escort. There were 90,000 soldiers fighting on eight square miles of land. And there were 28,000 bodies, remnants of bodies, 21,000 Japanese killed on Iwo Jima and 7,000 American Marines. And I flew with 16 guys who didn't come back, five in training and 11 in combat. I could tell you the names, the dates, and how they died. And when the war ended on August 14th, 1945, I came home and I didn't have a purpose for life. Combat is stressful, but exhilarating for me. Can you imagine 20 years old flying P-51s? And then the letdown was so gigantic that I didn't have a soul. I served on Iwo Jima. I flew 19 missions over Japan. I flew with 16 young guys who didn't get home. And I lived for 30 years, not as a human being, not as a person. The war was easy. Coming home was hard. Speaking to my parents was impossible. Speaking to my sister, Maxine, was difficult. It was tough to talk with anybody. I had no buddies. I had no airplane. I had no mission to fly. I really had little purpose in my life. I married, met a lady by the name of Helene on Good Friday, 1949, on a blind date. We celebrated our 61st anniversary this past October, and uh, we have four sons, loving family, but I found no satisfaction in life until 1975. Helene said she wanted to learn how to meditate, and of course, if she did it, I had to do it. And for the first time in my life, at the age of 51, I felt grounded. I now had another purpose in life, similar to what I had when I served in the military. In 1983, I was invited to go to Japan, and Helene and I went to Japan. I went reluctantly. Japan was not a place I wanted to visit, and the Japanese were not people that I wanted to know. While we were there, she said to me, Robert, our youngest of four sons, would love Japan. And in 1984, he went to Japan. And that was 27 years ago. He hasn't come back yet. 1987, he had a meeting with a father, a samurai, uh, with his children because he wanted to marry their daughter. And this man asked Robert what, he did, what, what about his father. And he said, how old is your father? And Robert said, 63. Was he in the war? He said, yes. He said, what did he do? He was a pilot. What did he fly? P-51s. Where? Over Japan. The meeting broke up, and that man went back to his wife and told her to make a wedding. And she said, why? He probably hates you as much as you hate him. And he said, 
Any man who could fly a P-51 against the Japanese and live must be a brave man, and I want the blood of that man to flow through the veins of our grandchildren. Because of my sons, because of my wife, I became a changed man. I learned transcendental meditation, and I gave up a bit an addictive behavior, and I recognized last year the need for the veterans, the 1% of this country who represented us in war. Everybody knows what it is to prepare, to practice, and perform. But what does it mean if you're in the military? It means you learn how to kill. You learn how to kill. We've been at war for 24 cumulative years. Three million people, 1% of the population of America, have served us well. Two million of those three million have been in combat. And I know what combat is. And I also knew what the David Lynch Foundation was about. And one phone call, in one phone call, I asked, could we have a veterans division of the David Lynch Foundation? And instantaneously, the answer came back, yes. And this is the launch today of that foundation. And that's the way this began. It's why you and I are here tonight. We have now seen on CBS 60 Minutes an eight-week test of 28 young people going through psychiatric treatment, reliving their experiences as combat men. They figured out, the psychiatrists, that if we can do it with rape victims, we can do it with soldiers. In those eight weeks, the American government paid the drug companies $750 million for antidepressant and antipsychiatric drugs. And in those eight weeks, 1,200 and 88 veterans of American war in Iraq and Afghanistan committed suicide at the rate of 23 a day. I know that we can do better than we're doing now. The financial toll on our country is immeasurable. The physical and mental toll on our troops is and has been devastating, a national disaster hundreds of thousands of active duty personnel, discharged veterans and their families suffer from post-traumatic, combat-induced stress, PTS. They are not getting the help that they need. We have the ability to teach young people who are suffering tremendously. I knew my enemy, I knew what I was fighting for, but the, these young people are in a foreign land they can't pass a garbage can, they can't see a car coming by, they can't see a person coming by without thinking something bad is gonna to happen to them. And they're suffering very deep post-traumatic stress disorder and meditation can help them. I plead with you, if you have the ability to give, to please give, because if we had two months of the money that's spent for drugs, two months, we could teach TM to all three million veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they could get their life back through TM, as I did in 1975 when I learned. I appeal to all of you to think about what you can do to help us help them help themselves. Those who perform acts of kindness without expectation of reward receive the greatest reward of all, immortality. So give to this foundation, please. Let us all become immortal and help the young get over post-traumatic stress injury. Thank you very much. What's your message to the world, Dad? We're not the color of our skin. We're not the language we speak or the country we live in. We're all human beings. 
And we've kept inventing weapons, better weapons to kill people. And we're killing a long kind. And it's wrong. So hopefully we have Bob Roth, president of the David Lynch Foundation, on the phone. And Bob was very generous in accepting my father's request to start a warrior wellness campaign to teach veterans transcendental meditation. And the David Lynch Foundation is a great, great gift to the whole world, they have taught over 500,000 people this marvelous act of transcending on a daily basis. So, Bob, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can you hear, hear you. Clear? Clear. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, my brother. I uh, listened to the audio of the video that Ed Murphy uh, edited together, and I just have a few thoughts. There are 21 million veterans in America. Maharshi has been tra Maharshi's transcendental meditation has been available for 60 years, 59 years in the United States. It took one veteran, Jerry Yellen, that took this issue of serving the veterans who have served our nation. Jerry Yellen brought this to the forefront of Maharshi's transcendental meditation movement by the sheer force of his own will. And now, I believe millions and millions of veterans, not just in the United States, but all over the world, will be learning to meditate paid for by their government. I was thinking about Jerry today, I think about him often, but there's two wonderful quotes that I remember Maharshi spoke about, about success. Someone asked him once, if you have the good idea, what are the fundamentals for success? And Maharshi replied, two things. Conviction and persistence. Conviction, in my mind, is a vertical phenomena, deep into the core of my being. I have conviction about a relationship. I have a conviction about my dharma. I have a conviction about what is true. And persistence is maintaining that conviction over time. It's a horizontal phenomenon. From the moment Jerry Yellen transcended back in 1975 to, to his almost last breath, Jerry Yellen has had the conviction and persistence that those who serve their countries should not suffer needlessly. He has been successful. He is successful. The other quote from Maharshi, one time, uh, a person asked Maharishi, what do you do to get rid, what do you say to get rid of a person's doubts? What do you say, what information, what do you say to get rid of a person's doubts? And the doubt could be about anything. Point of knowledge, the meditation. In Jerry's case, it could be about the doubt about the relevance of transcendental meditation, which had its origins in the warrior caste. What, would, what could be said to get rid of those doubts of those veterans or anyone? And Maharshi replied two things. First, let me pause. Are you still hearing me okay? Loud and clear. Are you still hearing me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Maharshi replied two, he said two things to remove doubts. 
And think of Jerry Yellen when I give this answer, of Jerry standing before veterans, active duty military, cadets, the general public. What is the relevance of transcendental meditation to their lives? And Maharshi replied, how you, how you resolve doubts? He said, only knowledge wrapped in love can erase doubts. Only knowledge wrapped in love can erase doubts. Knowledge, information, satisfies the intellect. So Jerry had all the information about the technique, about the results, about the amount of money that people that the government was paying for drugs, but only love can ease the doubt in the heart. And every veteran, and you saw it in that video, and I have tears in my eyes, every veteran, every active duty military, every cadet, every one of us, knew Jerry Yellen was a man of love. And when he spoke, he eased the doubts. So Jerry Yellen, you are infinite, you are unbounded, you are eternal, you are not just a resilient warrior, you are an enlightened soul, and you have blessed the David Lynch Foundation, you have blessed veterans, you have blessed the world, and it has been an honor for all of us to know you and love you, Jay Gurudev. And Stephen Yellen, you are a great, great man. Thank you, Bobby. We all love you very much. So now I'd like to ask the president of Maharshi University of Management, who we're very honored to have here, Dr. John Hagelin. Thank you very much for the honor of being among you. This last mission that Jerry has been on for these, these last years, it's, it's his 20th mission, I like to think of it as. And the one mission that I personally have had an opportunity to share with him and have been enormously enriched and empowered by it. Jerry's story is fundamentally a story about redemption, a remarkable and exquisite redemption that was powered, I think, by two things primarily, and that is the constant and redeeming love of Helene and the entire loving family. Because one thing you can say about Jerry is that he exuberantly exudes love and friendship. He can forge a bond in a moment, and with anybody. And that really has become the message of his life, to create a bridge and to melt, as love can melt, the completely manufactured gulfs between peoples and races and nationalism and so forth. And he just embodies that completely. And the other message he has brought now, a message that has snowballed enormously, it's a ball he got rolling, and it is snowballing to the point where it has touched a half a million people, and it is just growing, as we speak, enormous. And that is the tool of meditation that many of us in this town have been blessed with, which is as timeless and as simple as it is profound and powerful. It's basically a technique to realign oneself, one's mind, with one's deepest, truest self. To consistently and regularly realign oneself with one's truest, most universal self. And Jerry, breathed universality. It's extraordinary the transformation he lived through. 
Uh, it's a miraculous transformation. It's an amazing story. It's an inspiring story that touches everybody when they hear it. It's like a perfect messenger of this complete redemption and overcoming in the process the devastation of war and the traumatic stress that had so etched his life. So speaking as he does, as we've just heard, with such enormous power and conviction and pursuing this with such incredible drive, he has brought relief and now a whole movement adopted recently by our, both the Pentagon and the Veterans Administration to put their resources behind something that according to the study that was done, big one, just completed by the Pentagon, conducted by the Veterans Administration, a technique for relief that is at least twice as powerful as prolonged exposure, as psychotherapy, and without the terrible trauma that you have to live through if you pursue that particular route. So it's because of that, the military is just testing the waters to see whether this is a service that can be delivered on the scale that they need it. And that is, a, is indeed a challenge and something we are committed, a challenge we're committed to rising to. But Jerry got that started. He has taken his remarkable life story of redemption and he is giving it to everyone. And he is a force. He is a force. And that force is bringing soon to millions, half a million today, millions tomorrow. Hopefully, all the millions of people who need it he lived a life of service and honor. He honored our country. He honored and served his fellow warriors in this remarkable way on this his 20th mission. He's honored and served his loving wife, his family. He's honored and served his fellow human being. And he's brought great honor to this town great pride and power to this town. I just, I just have to thank him for a life so exquisitely lived and a story and a life so exquisitely shared with such depth and power and poignancy in his remarkable writings. A life that he has so generously shared with all of us and for millions more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hagelin, for your leadership of the university, your leadership of our country, and your leadership of the world. Now let's hear from someone in the military, Jonathan Friedman. They say you should never meet your hero because they will always let you down. While I had seen him around, I had only really met Jerry Yellen learning the TM City technique over 25 years ago. I was 16 and he was a spry 77. My initial assessment is that he was just some old guy, because when you're 16, in the best case, you're just, a, you're just an inexperienced idiot. Jerry, though, would never become the quintessential crotchety old Jewish man, even into his 90s, though he rightly commented I had become one in my 40s. <laughs> Jerry and I grew close in 2003 when I joined the United States Army. I felt a call at 28, much the same as Jerry had at 17. My call was one of service, but Jerry's was one of vengeance. Vengeance against those who had attacked our country, making his journey all the more remarkable. He understood completely what it meant when I joined, even before I fully had. You're not supposed to join the Army if you're a Jewish Harvard graduate, and certainly not if you're a practitioner of Transcendental Meditation. But Jerry understood why I felt that call. 
When I saw him after I signed up, he never asked why. He just smiled at me with that twinkle in his bright blue eyes and said, good for you. It was not until years later that I truly appreciated the magnitude of those words. While I wasn't looking for his approval, his validation meant the world. When I deployed both times to Iraq and then to Afghanistan, Jerry always went out of his way to check in with my family to see how I was doing. Those considerate gestures that helped make him so special to those who knew him. But I would like to speak about the journey that Jerry made, the one that I'm in a unique position to tell. A journey that made him so special to every veteran who heard his story. The obvious thing for me to do would be to discuss the hero that Jerry was rather than the hero that Jerry became. That first hero became a pilot at 19, flew strafing runs at, uh, runs at Iwo Jima, led air missions in the Pacific to include the final combat mission of World War II, where he lost yet another friend in his squadron, totaling 16 young men gone. Names Jerry would carry with him all his life. But, the, but more unique is the story of the hero Jerry became, a man committed to healing and the betterment of humankind. His journey of love and light, a journey that made hero, Jerry a hero to many of us decades after his war. That journey involved his learning transcendental meditation. It centered around his son Robert going to Japan and introducing his father to Robert's soon-to-be father-in-law and about finding friendship with an old enemy. It led Jerry to don his old uniform to speak to audiences around the world about his experiences at war, about building the bonds of trust and love that can overcome past divisions. I heard this story so many times, I could almost recite it from memory, most recent time being when we last saw one another in October. But every time Jerry told it, he made it unique and special, every single time. Jerry's journey to light was driven by love, as he told us, he was a broken man after the war, never damaged enough to look shell-shocked, but damaged by the deepest scars. Jerry struggled to overcome his wounds of the mind and of the soul. Jerry told us, the war was easy, coming home was hard. But like most normal people, I couldn't appreciate this too until I came home from war. Until a few blocks away from here, during one of our Friday art walks, surrounded by friends in this community, I almost came undone. I was older and had numerous t tools to help me cope, but I still got so close, so very close to losing it. Jerry had none of these tools, and yet he was able to overcome it all on his own. For the next 30 years after his return, Jerry often told us that he lived not as a human being, but as a shell of a man. For his wife, for his sons, and for the rest of his family, it could not have been easy. Deployed, I had the thrill of being in the thick of the action. Jerry experienced the awe of, the, of an endless sky. But when you think about it, when soldiers go off to war, their families go, to, go into battle as well. A daily battle against fear and uncertainty, never knowing if or when that dreaded knock at the door might come, never knowing when to expect a telegram no one wants to receive. And things don't really improve once we've, retur we've returned. Family members must tiptoe around us, trying hard not to say the one unpredictable thing that might set us off. It cannot have been easy for Jerry's family. But ultimately, it was the love for them that freed Jerry from the pain of war. And, it was, and this is how we should choose to honor him, for making such a choice, a courageous choice to heal, to go on, to share that love with other veterans who needed it too. I can tell you from personal experience, it takes more than just a desire to heal. It takes the love of family, a love that you all had for Jerry, a love that he had for you. The courage to heal his mind, though, to follow th through following his wife's guidance to learn transcendental meditation was the same courage that brought Jerry to Japan to sit down with Taro Yamakawa. Not only to meet him, but to befriend this man, who had been an enemy, who Jerry had been trained to hate and kill, to be able to call Taro his brother. And through, though he would brag about all of his grandchildren, his three amazing grandkids who were half American and half Japanese brought him a special joy and helped heal his soul. It was this courage, this bravery to face down his demons and walk away like the cocky fighter pilot who flew his first solo mission at 19 that instilled in all of us a fervent belief that Jerry just might live forever. Indeed, even in my last real call with him, when I asked him how he was, he said, well, I'm doing pretty well, but you know, I'm in hospice. 
When I replied by expressing my disappointment with a choice four-letter word, he replied, I'm 93 years old, buddy. I've had a good run. I spent the rest of the phone call thanking him. I thanked him for being an example of a courage to heal. I thanked him for being a light guiding so many of us towards hope and recovery from the invisible wounds of war. I thanked him for the love that he gave and showed to us all. And when I got off that call, I cried. Not so much tears of sadness, but of gratitude to have been so blessed to say to a man such as Jerry how much I loved him, how much light he had brought to my life and to all of ours. And so it comes time to say goodbye to that toothy grin, to that twinkle of the eye, to a man of courage and wisdom, to a soldier of hope and fortitude, to a fighter pilot who fought for peace and painted our skies with trails of love and light that now stretch to eternity. To my mentor, to my friend, I can only thank you for being there for me, for being there for us all. And I did what they said not to do. I met my hero and how glad I am that, he, that I did. I salute Captain Jerry Yellen of the United States Army Air Corps today, as I did on a beautiful spring day on the sacred steps of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And to tell you that I look forward to our next meeting upon that endless horizon of love and light. Jerry, may God bless you on this next journey. It will surely be your greatest flight ever. Godspeed. Thank you, Jonathan. Very beautiful. Now I'd like to conclude today by telling you three stories. First, I had the pleasure of living with my father for two and a half years in Orlando. And he said to me many times, he said, you know, Stephen, these are the best years I've ever experienced. He would get up in the morning, he would play 18 holes of golf, he would come home, he would run in the pool for 30 minutes, and then he would travel at least twice a month, sometimes three times a month, all over the country. I mean, literally, I couldn't keep up with his schedule. So here's the first story. He has gotten many awards, um, being the man he is and what he did in the war and his service. So he was supposed to get an award on Wednesday, about a month ago. And I could see over the past few weeks before that that his health was declining. I remember we would watch TV at night, and one night I looked at him, and I saw the piranha was leaving. It was very, very visible, and I realized, okay, here we go. So his strength was declining. He couldn't play 18, he couldn't play nine. He would go out and he would play five or six holes and often he would have to come home completely exhausted and he would sleep for the rest of the afternoon. But of course he never complained. So he was supposed to get an award, receive an award on Wednesday about a month ago. And on Monday he says, Stephen, you know, I just don't feel I can get up and receive this award. It was a breakfast meeting award and he would have to get up early and we'd have to travel about 45 minutes and of course I was going to drive him because I wouldn't let him really drive except around the corner at that point in time. So he said, Stephen, will you go and accept it for me? And I said, of course, Dad. I'd be greatly honored to go. So Tuesday night, the next day, he says, Stephen, I'm going to get up and go. I said, Dad, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm going to go. I said, okay. So we get up early, we get in the car, it's about 7 o'clock in the morning, and we're driving about 45 minutes. And I turn to him and I say, Dad, who's giving you this award? And he says, I have no idea. I said, you're going to receive an award and you don't know who it's from. He says, it doesn't matter, it's fine. I said, okay. So it was a breakfast meeting award and I thought, okay, you know, a few people there and they give him an award. So we pull up to a small university in Orlando, and I see all these people pi uh, filing into this auditorium in, in uh, what's called casual business dress with a jacket and no tie. 
and I see the parking lot is completely full. So we walk into this beautiful, magnificent auditorium that has the music playing and has a big video screen and images, and there's 500 people sitting down there for breakfast. And both of our jaws dropped. Oh my goodness, this is the real deal. PBS Orlando was there videotaping it. It was put on by Dell Webb, which is uh, a big developer of senior citizen communities around the country. And they honor people in the twilight of their life who are still doing remarkable things. And they gave out 17 awards. And my father was the last to receive the award. And he got up, he made a beautiful two or three minute speech, and we walked out of the auditorium completely exhilarated. And that afternoon we had a doctor's appointment at five o'clock. And I thought we were going to talk about perhaps different modalities of treating his lung cancer because my brother is a physician and he mentioned, well, we can do this, we may be able to do this. So I said, okay, maybe there's a a glimmer of hope here. So we walk into the doctor's office. We sit down. He looks at the doctor and he says, I'm ready to die. And the doctor looks at him and says, now Jerry, we have drugs for depression, for anxiety. And my father says, I I'm not depressed. I don't have any anxiety. This is the end of my life cycle. I could feel it. So the doctor was very flustered because he never heard this coming from someone who was so integrated and balanced and just knew that this was the end of his life cycle. So that evening we called hospice and the next morning hospice came in and they are absolutely miracle workers. They set up a hospital bed in his room which goes you know, back and forth, up and down because he really couldn't he was losing strength on a, almost like on an hourly basis, so he needed that. So hospice came in and he treated, he was, they were there for two weeks essentially. So here's the second story. So every afternoon um, I would go out and hit golf balls or play golf for an hour because we, I say we, my brother Michael and myself were there the whole time and we, I just needed to reconnect with nature for a little bit. So I would go out and then Michael would go and work in the gym and we would sort of alternate. So I come back, it's a Thursday, 21st of December, and it's about quarter of five, and I walk into the room and there was death all around him. I knew he was gonna die. I've seen people die, I know what, what the experience and what the feeling is. And Michael was there, and the hospice nurse was there. At that point in time, we had a 24-hour hospice nurse staying with us. And I knew that this was irreversible. There is no miracle recovery gonna happen here. He was 99% essentially dead at that point in time. His breathing was labored, he had very pale skin, the expression on his face, everything. So we're sitting in the room, or we're standing in the room watching him for about 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, his eyes pop open with this look of amazement and wonder and awe. And the contrast between his expression before he opened his eyes and when he opens, opened his eyes was as great a contrast as you could see in a human expression. It was the expression of like a child who wakes up on Christmas morning and sees presents everywhere. They cannot believe it. And of course, I knew what he was experiencing. He was a great, great soul, a very great gift to the world and he was being prepared and had a vision of what happens when the dweller in the body leaves the body. And he had this expression for about 30 seconds, and of course I was looking around to see if I could see anything, but my vision is not quite that refined. 
And he kept his eyes open for 30 seconds, and then he closed his eyes, and then two minutes later, he was gone. The third story is four days ago, Sarah, who was here, and I went to pick up his ashes. And it was a very, very sad ride. It was not a very joyful experience. Both of us drove about 40 minutes to the funeral parlor to pick up his ashes, and we really didn't say a word. We, we were overcome, more or less, by the moment. And we pulled into the funeral parlor and parked the car, and Sarah wanted to stay inside. So I went in, I signed all the papers, got his death certificate, and got his ashes, some of which will be transported to Japan and be united with my mother's ashes at Honin Temple that you saw. And I got in the car, and I pulled off into the main road, and then all of a sudden, this feeling of unboundedness started to emanate from my chest right here. And it went out a couple hundred feet in both directions. And it really took me by surprise because this was not the experience that I was feeling. And this feeling of unboundedness was associated with my father's consciousness. And all of a sudden, I went from having this experience of being completely overwhelmed by the moment to this experience of great joy and bliss, one can say bliss, that when someone is released from the physical structure, they are liberated. They are no longer contained in the mortal coil, in the mortal body. And for sure, I was not expecting an experience like this. It lasted for about five minutes, and then it went away. And of course, you know, my overshadowing feelings that I have also disappeared with that. So my father is in a very good place. He didn't believe in reincarnation at all. He only believed that what you see, essentially, is what you get. You live your life once, you hurt him. But fortunately, very fortunately, the laws of nature operate independent of human belief and human reason. And this is why I had two very conflicting emotions during this whole time, because I remember when I realized, even before he went into hospice, I realized he was going to leave us, and I called Ed Malloy, and I couldn't even talk. I was so overwhelmed with emotion, and I had to call him back. But then, during these two weeks, I had two very conflicting emotions running through me simultaneously. One is I was very excited for him, because I knew what was going to happen. There was no question about that. When a righteous soul passes on, it's a time of celebration. It's not a time of despair or gloom. And at the, simultaneously, I had this experience of being completely overwhelmed because this was not only my father, this was my roommate, this was someone who I looked forward to getting up every day. And there's a book by Saul Bellows called Seize the Day. And he would just seize the day. And it was, a, it was a wonder, an absolute wonder, to behold a 93-year-old man with such energy, with such love of life. Every cell in his body believed that we are all connected. This was not some superficial idea or words. When we went to a restaurant, if you were within 20 feet, of my father, you had no chance. <laughs> this was the Venus fly plant. <laughs> so for me to see that on a regular basis, it filled my heart and my mind with deep joy. And to feel that he's gone, which is almost incomprehensible 
to all of us. It's something that we have to integrate, but know that he is in a very good place, very, very good place. So from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure I speak for my family, I deeply appreciate you coming out here today to honor a very, very great soul, Jerry Yellen. Thank you.